Okay. Hello, everyone. So as Gal mentioned, my name is Molly Bryant, and I'm an LS and LMSW here in Tulsa. Um, I use the pronoun she, her, hers, and I'll be facilitating this presentation today. Just very briefly, I want to give you um, a little bit of information about myself so you know who is speaking to you today. Um, so I'm a born and bred Oki. I um, grew up here. I love Oklahoma most of the time. Um, I spent a year in West Africa after high school. I have no idea why my parents let me do that, but they did. Um, I went to college in Kansas City and then spent several years living, studying, and working in Latin America with social justice and human rights organizations. Um, I'm a proud member of the Cherokee Nation. And I do work for OU Tulsa and for Divis. Um, and in my role at Divis, I am lucky enough to um, get to work with, honestly, like the coolest, most resilient, um, just most creative clients who have all survived domestic and sexual violence, um, all of whom have informed my understanding of sexual violence and systemic oppression, and all of whom have guided me to be a better ally and advocate and social worker, which is why I'm here today. So I'm super excited to be here to share with you um, some of the information and wisdom that they have really um, taught me and that I've learned from survivors, from my clients, and from our community here. So let's go to the next slide. So here is our agenda. I want to set the expectation. So this is a super speedy presentation. So I'm going to try to get all of this information to you in about 45 minutes. Um, okay, so this, these are the expectations. So expect to get information about what sexual violence looks like in Native communities, in the LGBTQ plus community, in Latinx, specifically Latinx immigrant communities, in deaf communities, and a little bit about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. You'll learn about the prevalence of domestic violence and sexual violence, the barriers that underserved communities face when seeking, violent, when seeking help and healing from service providers like ourselves. Um, and then you will get some tips on how to advocate for survivors from these underserved communities tips on how to advocate more at the meso and macro level than on the micro. Um, and I also wanna give a, tr a quick trigger warning that this is a quick but heavy presentation. We are talking about sexual violence. So even though, um, you know, this is kind of rapid fire presentation, this is heavy stuff. So please um, make sure to take care of yourself while you're listening to this. Take deep breaths, make sure you drink water. I have water with me. Um, just know that I will do my best to not share too many high impact stories. Um, but since this is around sexual violence, they will have an impact, especially for those who have experienced sexual violence firsthand. Okay, let's get into it. So. For those who are bound by their social work code of ethics, which are a lot of us on this call, um, and I'm sure many other counseling professionals have a similar code of ethics, um, it is our duty and responsibility to advocate to end oppression, period. So in our code of ethics, I took this straight from the code, social workers are sensitive to cultural and ethnic diversity and strive to end discrimination, oppression, poverty, and other forms of social injustice. Social workers respect the inherent dignity and worth of the person. So that kind of sets the tone for why we're talking about specifically um, populations that have been ignored or silenced by mainstream sexual violence movements in the United States. Okay. Evidence of sexual violence. There's a little picture of grains of salt here, and that is on purpose. So it is a reminder that we need to take statistics with a grain of salt or with some grains of salt. Um, 
So these statistics are the most up-to-date, the most relevant statistics that I can find. Um, and I'm typically quite thorough, but that doesn't mean that I'm gonna have everything perfect here. Um, that being said, statistics give us a part of the picture, but they don't give us the full picture. So these stats are based on reporting of sexual violence. So reports of sexual violence, and they also are adjusted based on other variables. So we know that reports don't equal what's actually happening. So it, there are, they are adjusted based on variables of understanding that not everyone's gonna report, that there's stigma in communities, there's fear, um, and there's a lot of other legitimate reasons why survivors don't report. Um, so while the numbers are probably higher than what these stats actually say, these are pretty close estimates to what sexual violence looks like in the US. Um, before we dive into these, I also just wanna add, please freely use the chat box because I have it up here and it's really nice, even if you just have like, ooh, ah, hey, that's interesting. Um, it's because I can't really see your faces and this can't be as interactive as we are in person. Please feel free to just throw in whatever you want in the chat box so I know that I'm not completely boring you throughout this presentation. Okay, here we go into the stats. So, sexual assault statistics. These are in general throughout the US. One in five women in the United States have been a victim of attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. One in 33 men in the U.S. have been the victim of attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. When we look at domestic violence, one in four women in the U.S. have experienced severe. So this is not, so it's even um, a little bit more. So they've actually experienced severe intimate partner violence, and that's typically severe physical violence, even though we know domestic violence encapsulates a lot of other things and is not just physical. Um, this stat is specifically around severe physical violence. One in four women and one in nine men, which will probably surprise many people that it is so many men who are um, experiencing intimate partner violence. If you are only paying attention to the narrative um, that you hear in the media or in, um, I don't know, Netflix, just other shows, other things that you may see, um, we do not often hear about men being survivors. So um, it is important to note that men, there, anyone can be a survivor of domestic violence or sexual assault. We need to really reduce um, the stigma that this is only for, this is only something that affects women. That being said, this is still a very, very gendered issue. Um, and the more vulnerable you are, the more likely you are to be victimized by sexual violence. We're going to talk about that. When we look at Native communities, so this is a picture from the Native Alliance Against Violence, which is a fabulous organization in Oklahoma. If you don't follow them, they are our um, tribal coalition in Oklahoma, and they do fantastic work. Okay, so remember the stats we had before. So those are just generalized for the US. When you kind of drill down to look at um, what we're gonna call underserved populations, there's not, there's a lot of different ways, you could, things you could say. When you drill down specifically to Native women, more than 55% of Native women have experienced physical intimate partner violence in the US. Studies in Oklahoma, however, show that rates may be closer to 80 to 88%. That should give you like, that should make you just like sick to your stomach, okay? 80 to 88% of Native women in Oklahoma. If you talk with Native women um, who are living specifically in Indian country and in rural areas, um, in really in, in, in deep Indian country, you will often hear um, women say, show me those women who haven't been, who haven't been victimized by sexual violence um, because it is so prevalent. Native women are 1.5 times as likely as white women to be physically injured due to intimate partner violence. 
So not only is it more likely that they will be victimized, but more likely that it will be more severe. They're also less likely um, to have access to medical facilities. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to engage in that chat box again. So very quickly, what are some, when we think about Native women, when we think about Native communities and domestic violence, what do you think? So you help me. What are some of the specific tactics or forms of abuse that an abuser may use against a Native woman? Like what, what does this look like? Or what might this look like? IPV, I'm so sorry. IPV is intimate partner violence. So anytime you see IPV or DV, um, they're the same thing. Domestic violence can be more, but we're mostly talking about intimate partner violence. So between two partners. Any ideas of what domestic violence might look like? If we don't have any ideas, that's fine. I'll give you some ideas. Um, yes, Ka yes, Kaylee is hitting on something that I'm going to get into a little more detail. But yes, so there are um, different jurisdictions and different laws which make Native women on Native, on tribal land, um, much more vulnerable because people are not held accountable, um, literally able to get away with violence. Yeah, there's also, if you don't know about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, missing and murdered Indigenous people, um, I really encourage you to start following that information. Um, there's a lot of great information out there. Um, uh, it's just very common that Native women aren't going to be taken seriously. Um, and yeah, so you all are hitting on a lot of really important things. There are la la yeah, lack of access to resources. Um, abusers may prevent victims from practicing their traditional ways. They may force them to um, practice mainstream religions. They may prevent them pr from practicing. Um, there's also, yes, multi-generational trauma. Um, there's a lot of different ways that this can, ways that this can come up. Thank you. I'm sorry, again, this is like rapid fire. So we're just gonna, yes. All of that is awesome. In the chat box, you are all like hitting the nail on the head. Okay, when we're talking about sexual assault and rape, one in three Native American has been the victim of rape or sexual assault. One in three. Blank out of 10, and this is where I want you in the chat box to guess. Blank out of 10 of those perpetrators, so one in three Native American women has, has been the victim of rape or sexual assault. When we talk about those women, blank out of 10 of those perpetrators against Native women are non-Native. How many do you think? We've got some guesses going. Good, just start guessing. Good, we got eight, nine, seven, four, eight. Yeah, 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 seven, one, nine. Okay, awesome. Nine. Nine out of 10 of those perpetrators against Native women are non-Native. There are a lot of reasons for this. Um, the short version of a very long story is that tribal governments do not have jurisdiction over non-Native perpetrators of sexual violence, specifically sexual assault, on their land. So this jurisdiction uh, for crimes like this falls under the federal government, the U.S. federal government, who often do not consider, a sexual, consider sexual violence in Indian country a priority for their resources or their energy. This is also true under the current Violence Against Women Act. Yes, this is what I'm wanting to see, that anger that you're feeling. I love actually seeing that in the chat box because that is what we should be feeling. We should be feeling angry and disturbed by these statistics and by this information. Um, so yes, this is true and legal under current law. This has been reauthorized over and over. Um, if this sparks your attention, I'm gonna plug another Haru presentation next week. So I will be leading another webinar on Tuesday, actually, from three to four, specifically on this subject. So specifically on sexual violence in Indian country and the laws and overlapping jurisdictions that make Indian country a hunting ground for sexual violence. Um, 
it needs a full lecture, unfortunately, to talk about all of this. Okay, barriers for service providers. I am um, actually kind of changed up what those barriers look like. Sometimes when we talk about barriers, we're talking about um, why people don't come see us. And what I really want us to talk about is what we are doing to make sure that we are accessible and we are the ones breaking down the barriers for our community. So we're, the way that we look at systems to make sure that we are changing them for specifically survivors of sexual violence. But this, these sort of things apply for any type of um, service you're providing for underserved communities. So barriers for service providers, um, you have to understand that Native communities and people who are Native are walking around carrying oppression on their bodies. They have experienced racism among many other forms of oppression. They're also carrying historical trauma in their bodies. Okay, so there is a, a strong mistrust of dominant culture organizations. There is a fear of losing custody of children based on history of boarding schools and forced adoption. I am um, the proud granddaughter of a runaway Native American who was forced into an Indian boarding school. My grandmother ran away twice from her boarding school, um, but she was very adequately stripped of her culture and her language and her traditions. Um, a way of life that she knew and she was never able to reclaim that. The trauma of, of being taken from her family and forced into those boarding schools has trickled down in my family. So when we talk about historical trauma, um, I mean, it is real. Like <laughs> it is not just carried in our, in our bones, but I still, I still carry that with me every day when talking about like having a mistrust of organizations, I still carry that with me too. Um, so just know that that's what, that's what people are walking into um, whenever they're seeking help or that's why they're not coming in. There's also a large lack of culturally appropriate services or understanding of Native values. So when you're looking at your organization or your practice, um, what kind of some questions to ask yourself are, are there options for justice outside the legal system in your organization? Do you have options for restorative justice? Do you have support groups for people of color or Native women? Um, do you offer referral lists for tribal programs that offer sweats or other traditional forms of healing? You know, what can you also offer for these communities? Okay. We're also going to talk about LGBTQ plus communities. It is also Pride Month, and this is Mar Marsha P. Johnson, the founder of Pride. If you don't know Marsha P. Johnson, look her up. Okay, question for the chat box. Are the rates of domestic violence in the LGBTQ community higher, lower, or the same as in the general population? I see some peer pressure happening here. Everybody's saying higher. No one's going to deviate from that. It's the same. So I know that was kind of a trick question. So the rates, when you look at it as a whole, are very much the same. Um, so it's 44% for lesbian women compared to 35% for heterosexual women. So yes, a little bit higher there very high for bisexual women, only 26% for gay men compared to 29% for, oh, I'm sorry, I misspelled that, heterosexual men who have experienced intimate partner violence, 37% of bisexual men. Here's the thing though, this is the stat that, is, that we have. This is the best statistic that we have to go off of. Um, there, aren't, there isn't a lot of research and that's why we have this stat to use. When you had started adjusting, which, I don't have the like data on this, but I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna put this out there. If you were to start adjusting these numbers for race and socioeconomic status, the rates of this would change. So, um, so yeah, 
Research isn't great. People have not devoted a lot of time to studying LGBTQ sexual violence because it is still a new topic. We in the domestic violence movement in particular really had this idea of this binary idea of domestic violence being women were the victims, men were the, the abusers or the aggressors, and it was within heterosexual relationships. And so they're really, why would there be reason to study anything beyond that? So while these stats say they're the same and they kind of are, everything can be adjusted. Um, yeah, that's why I say take this with a grain of salt. So very briefly, again, breezing through this, in the chat box, what do you think are some LGBTQ specific tactics that a domestic violence, domestic violence in particular, an abuser may use against their victim? I will get us started with one. One is to use the myth that we have been perpetuating as domestic violence providers, that domestic violence is between a man and a woman, and that men are the aggressors and women are the victims. So if you use that myth, it's really hard to say, my male partner is a victim. You can't, you can use that myth, myth against them, right? Are there other things that you think that people could use? Outing them without their consent is huge. Thank you, Ellie. Threatening to out someone to their family, to their community, well, yes, to their family, to their business, to their employer, um, yes, Bethany and Ellie really, that's like so common, unfortunately, and so true. Um, happens all the time, and it is incredibly powerful to out, to threaten, to out someone. Um, yeah, also using the values, using guilt, using, um, Things, I mean, I didn't even write this down because I didn't want to dig into it, but let's talk about it. Also using um, religion, using things like, hey, the Bible says this, or my religion says this, or, you know, whatever it is, or using, hey, our culture says this is not okay. Um, there's a lot of stigma attached to being gay, and <laughs> if you are outed for that, you may lose your community. You may lose your support network, too. Um, there's also a lot of ways like keeping your name off of joint assets, right? Um, saying that's just fighting and not abuse. Okay, thank you all. Here's an awful statistic we're going to talk about. 46%. So when we're talking again, now we're that was domestic violence. We're going to talk about sexual assault. 46% of bisexual women have been the victim of rape or sexual assault. 46% compared to 20% of heterosexual women, women and 13% of lesbian women. I want you to take note that regardless of sexual orientation, 90 to 95%, I can, if anyone wants to push me on this, I can find the stat for you like right after this, but 90 to 95% of those perpetrators of sexual violence are all men, regardless of sexual orientation of the woman. There are a lot of questions around why this might be the case. Um, bisexual women in particular who are survivors have said that one of the reasons they think this is the case um, is because they often don't feel like they fit into either the LGBTQ community or the straight community. Um, and we know that the more isolated you feel and the more isolated you are from your communities, um, the more vulnerable you are to sexual assault. Let's talk about trans survivors and trans individuals. This stat is for sure underreported. 50% of transgender individuals have been raped or sexually assaulted at one point in their lives. Um, this also changes based on race. If you are American Indian, it is closer to 65%. Um, if you are Black, it is 53%. If you're Middle Eastern, it is 58%. Um, but it's probably vastly underreported. For the chat box, y'all. 
what is, if you know the answer, don't put it because then you're gonna skew the results here. But what do you all think is the life expectancy of a trans woman of color? The hint is for the general population in the US, it is 81 years old for women and 76 for men. What is the life expectancy for a trans woman of color in the US? Good question, good answers. 37, 40, 50, about 30, 50, 40. You all are much closer. Yes, unfortunately, it is 35 years. The life expectancy for a trans woman of color is 35 years. Just want you to like sit with that for a second. So, um, whew, if, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Again, <laughs> we could spend a long time like unpacking all of this. Um, but let's talk about intersectionality and the layers of oppression that a trans woman of color is living with and carrying. Um, also, sexual violence plays a huge role in lowering the life expectancy for a trans woman of color. So I really encourage you to um, look at Human Rights Watch. Um, they have been collecting information on really the epidemic of um, trans women of color being murdered in the U.S. So Twana asked a really good question of what contributes to the low life expectancy. Um, part of that is, is this epidemic of, of women being killed and partly, um, I mean, and it's, yeah, we could go into a lot of details, um, but it is around sexual violence. So, um, in Dallas about six months ago, I keep saying six months ago, so it could have been a year ago, um, there were like three trans women of color killed within two weekends. Um, and last couple weeks, oh gosh, time is really hard right now with the <laughs> pandemic and everything that's going on. So maybe it was like two days ago. Um, but trans women of, of color are just being killed at enormous rates um, and are being victimized by sexual violence. So Human Rights Watch, look them up, just Google Human Rights Watch, Watch Trans Women of Color, and it will take you to all the information, um, and they'll be much, they'll, it, they'll explain it much better than I can in the very short amount of time we have. Okay, I really want to get through this. I'm so sorry. There's just so much information. Okay, barriers for service providers. We know huge barriers, homophobia homophobia of one, being afraid that if you walk in that door, that that service provider is not going to accept you for who you are. Also, fear of being outed. You just don't, you just never know who you can trust. Um, so a couple of things you can ask yourself are, what visual cues do you have that signal you are an inclusive organization? It may sound silly, um, but it makes a huge difference. Do you have visual cues? Do you have rainbow flags? I know it's silly. Do you have equality stickers? Um, do you have the gaily in your waiting room? Like what do you have that signals that you are a safer place for people? And then also, if you say you're a safer place, what kind of ongoing training are you actually giving to staff so that you actually are a safer place? Um, and like I mentioned, the gender binary myths of sexual violence are a huge barrier. And then historical trauma, again, it's gonna be for every single population we talk about today. This is our breather. We're gonna do a real quick, quick breather because we've got to breathe through about two and a half other populations. So just take a couple of breaths, just for, <sighs> breathe in and out. Let's talk about the Latinx immigrant community. We are not speaking only of the Latinx community. We are talking really about the immigrant community. We don't always have stats on that. So 13.6% of Latinas have experienced rape and 36% have experienced sexual assault other than rape. One in three Latinas 
sorry, one in three Latino women will experience domestic violence in their lifetime. This rate, if you'll notice, is approximately the same as for women of other racial and ethnic groups, like when we talked about Native women. It's very similar. Um, the difference is that Latino women in particular are less likely to seek services from mainstream organizations or from any institution. So only about 20% of Latina survivors seek formal support, such as even medical, legal, or counseling assistance. Why do you think that might be the case? If we're talking about here, kind of in Oklahoma, I saw there were people outside of Oklahoma, but no matter what. In the US, why do you think it might be the case that people are not seeking services? Thank you, Iraiz. Legal status, especially when you're talking about um, people who are undocumented or even semi-documented, um, legal status is puts people in a really vulnerable position. Racism is also plays a huge role. Yes, absolutely. Language barrier is huge. Yes. Those are three huge ones. Yes. Um, so some of yeah, so there's just a lot of reasons that Latinos would, well, that immigrants in, in general, but Latinx immigrants wouldn't seek services. Um, fear of deportation is huge um, and really valid. Um, we could go into a lot of that too, but it's really scary right now. And it's really valid to be fearful of interacting with institutions if you are afraid that law enforcement might get involved. So it's also, that also means that our abusers um, are able to use that fear and what's going on politically, honestly, um, for their benefit. So, um, so some of those tactics are threatening to call, so that abuser may say that they will threaten to call immigration services. Um, they may also threaten to withdraw petition for legal status if they are the person who is supporting, you know, a visa. Um, they may threaten to destroy pa important paperwork. They may, um, let's see, not allow a victim to learn English, to work, to learn how to drive, to socialize, to be able to really um, become a part of the community. Yes, there's also um, issues around like what is, is and isn't normal in the culture, um, what is uh, their cross to bear, as is often said. Um, and then, of course, there's always like stigma around like uh, just embarrassment and, and guilt for survivors themselves. Barriers for service providers. Again, racism and xenophobia, huge. So what kind of ongoing training are you doing to offer for your staff? What are you doing to ensure that your staff are better informed around their own privilege, their own implicit bias, and also systemic racism and xenophobia? Communication, as was mentioned in the chat box, yes. Um, do you have bilingual, bicultural, or multilingual, multicultural staff? If you don't, or even if you do, do you have access to interpretation? Is it easy to access that interpretation? <sighs> A lot of questions. Um, like we mentioned, there's mistrust of institutions as well, um, fear of deportation. Again, what kind of message are you sending to people? Do you have any signage that explains that people, regardless of legal status, are welcome to receive services? Um, do you have any signage? And are you doing anything to let the community know that? It takes a lot of work. <laughs> Iris is on this, and we have done a lot of work to remind people that you don't have to call police, that you don't have to have legal status to access DIVA services, but it is an ongoing conversation. It is not a one-time thing. Um, and then also, uh, barriers for us as service providers are our policies. So whenever we have anti-immigrant policies in our communities, those are barriers. Um, in Tulsa County in particular and Okmulgee County, um, we have a 287G program, which is an anti-immigrant program in our county jails that um, 
rounds, well, that we could also go into a lot of details about, but it, um, it really puts our immigrant communities, undocumented communities at risk and deports a lot of people who should not be deported. Um, that's the short, short, short version. So what are you actively doing? Are you actively showing up for immigrants? Are you going to community forums? Are you posting on social media? And then are you following through on that? These are a lot of questions you get to ask yourself as we all ask ourselves every day as well. Okay, we've got about 15 more minutes. I'm gonna get us till 10 till for the questions. <clears throat> Let's talk about the deaf, deaf communities and people with disabilities. So in the chat box, I want you to try to guess again. Deaf women are blank times more likely than hearing women to experience domestic violence. Thoughts, guesses. Got a couple guesses coming in. Very good guesses. It's actually three. Um, so deaf women are three times more likely. That's 300%. That's a significant, that's a lot. 100%, three times more likely than hearing women to experience domestic violence. So abusers are often hearing people. Um, and there are a lot of reasons that deaf women are, are and can be more vulnerable. Um, some specific tactics that are used to, well, okay, one thing I'll say is they're three times more likely to experience domestic violence on top of that the violence is often much longer and more severe. Um, it is harder to get out of relationships when you are a deaf person, especially with a hearing abuser. So <clears throat> it's a lot easier to be much, to be isolated, honestly, when you are a deaf survivor. So some of the tactics that, um, that are used against deaf survivors are, I mean, things like stealing or destroying your phone, which is probably going to be your access to the hearing world and also just the world in general, to your deaf friends as well, to the deaf community. Um, they also, there are also um, tactics like like, yeah, finding any way to prevent a survivor from communicating with the outside world. Um, also, sometimes hearing abusers will be asked to interpret for survivors, not knowing, of course, that they're the abuser. Um, and they miss, maybe misinterpret for the survivor. Um, there are also tactics of, of hurting or injuring a deaf survivor's hands, which is their form of communication. Um, overusing things like floor stomping or um, pounding on the table, which are in moderation and used thoughtfully part of ASL, um, but overusing that can be really abusive. Um, signing really close to someone's face can be really abusive if you're really angry and you're showing that emotion. Um, making fun of ASL style, ASL being American Sign Language. Um, and then also if you're a parent, to children who are hearing. If the abuser doesn't let the children learn American Sign Language, it's gonna be a lot harder um, to have a relationship with your kids. And that can be extremely emotionally abusive as well. Barriers. I think you can guess what some of those barriers might be. But autism is, is oppression against the deaf community. So if you've not heard of autism, Add that to your list of oppression. So we have racism, classism, sexism, cis sexism, mm, autism. We just keep adding it. Autism. So um, for your organization or your practice, do you know about deaf culture? And how do you have ongoing trainings where you're learning about deaf culture and how to best serve deaf survivors? Um, Simple little thing, do you caption all of your videos when you're showing them at work, um, when you're showing them to funders, anytime you're showing videos, do you have captions? Um, for communication, does your organization have access to American Sign Language interpretation like we have today? 
Do you know how to easily access that interpretation? You may have it, but it may be really hard to figure out how to use it. Um, and then again, historical trauma. So deafness in the past, many years ago, was treated as a mental illness. Um, there was also the um, belief that there was this practice of forced oralism, um, which was not allowing deaf children to learn sign language. So it was forcing them to learn how to read lips, um, which is like an incredibly difficult skill uh, and talent to learn. So never expect someone to know how to read lips. Um, but this ensured that deaf culture, which is a strong, vibrant, like really amazing culture, it ensured that deaf culture was not passed down. Um, and it also ensured that deaf kids were more isolated um, and didn't know their language. Um, there was also segregation of schools. So we still have deaf schools um, and there's a lot of questions around deaf education, but there was segregation for a long time um, that all deaf kids would go to deaf schools and hearing kids went to hearing school. Also within those deaf schools, white deaf kids went to white deaf schools and black deaf kids went to black deaf schools. So there are very different cultures actually that stem from that as well. Um, there's also this really amazing, so I mean like, there's also this culture of fighting for your rights within the deaf culture, which is, which is really incredible. Um, deaf President Now protest, which um, my coworker taught me about, was a student protest in 1988 at Gallaudet University, which is a deaf university in the US. Um, the Board of Trustees had announced that they were gonna hire um, a hearing president and the student body like led an uprising and said no there was an equally good qualified uh deaf candidate for president and they said no like we you need to be hiring um deaf candidates for this i'm going to try to breeze through this okay people with disabilities are blank times more likely to be victims of sexual assault than people without disabilities i'm just going to go ahead and tell you there are seven Times more likely to be victims of sexual assault, 700%. If you want to know more about this, I really encourage you to listen. This is like an eight part series on NPR um, that they did in 2018. This one in particular is from counselors who worked with um, people who are intellectually and developmentally disabled who were survivors of sexual assault. Um, the series is called Abused and Betrayed, and I really encourage you to listen to that. Um, it's really, it's a really beautiful um, series, even though, of course, it's, it's hard to listen to sometimes. Barriers for survivors, again, ableism, add that to your list of, of words for oppression. Um, are you ADA compliant? You have to be, but are you? And are you beyond ADA compliant? Are you doing things because you don't have to be, but because you want to be? Um, what size simple things, another simple fix is what size are the prints on your material that you, like your intake materials, your outreach materials, anything you're doing. Um, what do your intakes look like? Are they unnecessarily long? Do you need to be asking all those questions right then? Um, historical trauma and mistrust. I put Aristotle here because whew, Aristotle um, proclaimed that children with disabilities should not be allowed to live. And that's where we're starting with. So that's way back in 384 BC. Um, and that, that kind of idea of people being lesser than has just carried through society. We're not even going to talk about HISM because I really want to quickly talk about meso and macro advocacy that you can do. I'm going to do this in five minutes. Okay. Meso and macro advocacy. This is what you can and should be doing. Again, this is from our social work code of ethics. Social workers should engage in social and political action that seeks to ensure that all people have access to the resources, employment, services, and opportunities they require to meet their basic human needs and to develop fully. So, 
Do not take for granted the simple statement of support or a kind call in to a colleague, especially right now. To see on the mezzo can also, um, yes. Yeah. So that's like, start with your internal work. If you are looking to advocate for any type of oppressed group, but you have not done your own internal work, start there first. We also need to retrain ourselves from thinking that it's impolite to speak up and change that to it's unjust to stay silent. Okay, we are social workers, we are professionals, um, we have to be speaking up. We can help make internal policy changes, even simple policy changes like dress code, parental leave, PTO, sick day policies, like those are wrapped up in forms of oppression um, and we can help make those changes. Also, all of the white bullet points, all those questions that I said you can ask yourselves because that's what we're asking ourselves, those are all forms of mezzo and macro advocacy um, that you can be doing today. Some of those macro side advocacy, you can lobby to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, and you can also lobby to include um, more jurisdiction for tribal nations. You can work with the state to create laws. And I just threw in one that I think is really cool that we should all have, um, but allow, create laws that allow domestic violence victims to break their leases. We don't have that law, a lot of states have it, and that's just one of my soapboxes right now, that domestic violence victims aren't allowed to break their lease, um, even if their abuser has, um, has done something to them in that space and knows where they live. Um, you can also call your county commissioner right now if you're in Tulsa or Okmulgee County and ask them to end the 287G program because they can actually end it at any time. Okay, we are 12 minutes to the end, so I will show you my references and allow room for questions. Okay, thank you, Molly. Uh, we will give, uh, I, I remember that we had a questions at the beginning, a little bit at the beginning. Uh, I'm just trying to look where it was. Or if the person who wrote this is still with us, you can write again. But we have already one question. Marie just asked about Latinx immigrants. Marie um, just asked, are Latinx immigrants more likely to experience intimate partner violence than other immigrants? And no. Um, so no, they're not. There's actually, um, so one reason that they're often talked about is because they've been the most researched. Um, so there's more up-to-date statistics and they tend to be um, the highest population of immigrants in most communities in the U.S. So they get a lot more, um, honestly, attention when it comes to talking about immigrant populations. But there's also really good information as, um, on, on other immigrant populations. And if anyone's interested, I can always send um, some additional information, I don't know, with this PowerPoint or something. Um, around other populations, specifically like um, South Asian and um, yeah, South Asian populations as well. Yes, Molly, we have a lot of comments here. Thank you, very informative. Additional information is always welcome. Thank you very much. Here is a request. I would love any additional information you have on immigrant or refugee communities. Absolutely.
I was still looking for the question at the, the beginning <laughs> and I just I just can't back. The problem with the the chat that it's going it's going up and uh, down so quickly yeah. uh, and you you just lose the information uh, very very uh, quickly but uh, I guess that the person who wanted to ask the I mean they had a chance to to ask it again so I'm sorry I just oh, can't find it okay so do we have any more questions and um, as Molly said, we are going to have a session with her um, next week. Um, so keep tracking our links for the lectures and you can register um, like you did today. Well, there is a question. Yeah. Can you speak to how policies uh, like dress code, parental leave, PTO, sick day policies, etc., are rooted in oppression? And how changing those is a form of advocacy? I am on board. Just want more information. For sure. So I would love to speak to that because um, it definitely needs some unpacking. So let me just throw out. So for dress code. So when you start to look at um, dress, a lot of dress code policies, um, a lot of them are very much skewed. Okay, let's just, a lot of them are super sexist. Um, so they will, um, so we <laughs> really unpacked our Divis dress code and we're a predominantly, I and mean, we are a woman led organization, um, very feminist organization. And we still had a lot of gendered language and a lot of like, I mean, we had the word derriere in our dress code, um, you know, like, so I'll just say, when you start to look through dress codes, you start to see that there's some pretty oppressive language. Um, they can, they tend to be applied in either, so maybe even a, the application of it was sexist and also sizes. Um, so we saw that, like, you know, while in our dress code it said that some people weren't allowed to wear leggings, we noticed that, and I'm just not, I cannot think of anything, spe like, specifically, so I'm not calling out Divis, I'm just saying that, in general, um, if someone were to be called out for wearing leggings, it tended to be someone who was, who was larger in size, um, so it, play, it tends to play out in a more sizist way. Um, and in more sexist. Men tend to get away with more things when it comes to dress code um, and women don't. Also, they tend to be classist. So whenever you're told that <clears throat> you needed to dress more business-like, um, business-like tends to be very white, upper class, middle class style. Um, so I noticed that whenever I had like more important business meetings, um, I wasn't dressing the way that everyone else in the meeting was. So I bought a blazer, which is totally not my style. Um, but it was what everyone else was wearing. And that was like how I learned to fit in. And those things just aren't like neutral colors. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you start to unpack with dress code. And it's like, ooh, there's so much, like so much steeped in the way that we dress and the way that we interact. Um, so we now have, we're in a pilot phase, but it's been a while that we've been in this pilot phase. We're now in a dress for your day. That's it for the dress code. Um, and it's worked really well. Um, oh, hairstyles. Hairstyles were also part of the dress code, which talk about racism. <laughs> um, you try to police people's style and it gets really oppressive. <laughs> um, also just going to throw out just so I can say really specifically about a couple of the other policies. Um, when you're talking about parental leave and PTO sick day. So, um, I mean, PTO, so parental leave, I mean, we know that, um, that we don't have that access in the US like many other countries do. So um, it's, you know, not having access to parental leave is pretty classic. Um, the only people who are able to take time off after having a child or adopting children 
um, are people who have either um, and then or or people who have access to um, yeah people have access to money really and then also around PTO and sick day policies um, those really we noticed were skewed toward people who were able to have um, you know if there's a if there's a mom who is a single mom who um, you know she gets sick she has to take PTO there was a um, if you had to take a couple days of unscheduled PTO, you got written up. Um, oh God, we could just unpack so much around these policies. But what I encourage you to do is start to look at how it may negatively affect people who aren't um, who aren't super privileged, and you'll see that a lot of the policies disproportionately affect people who are who are struggling more. Um, okay, thanks, Tafina. It's hard to remember, we, I mean, when we unpacked those policies, I mean, we just started pulling out threads of them and you could like, you just started seeing how it all connected to oppression. Um, so yeah, I just, if you have access to look at your policies and your leadership allows you to, um, I encourage you to do that with, with the support of, of other people within your organization because it can make huge changes um, for, for the well-being of your staff and the work environment. Yeah. That was messy, but that's what I could do off the top of my head. Okay, thank you, Molly. Uh, do we have any more questions? You can also open the mic. Um, and ask the question if you would like to. Uh, we will wait a few seconds and if not, we will say goodbye. Okay, so it's look like we can say thank you. Thank you, Molly, for your thank time. You. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And, and, um, and thank you all for joining us. And let's have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.